Dr. Arvind Gupta joins us all the way from India, an uh, advisor to the largest opposition political party on technology and, uh, and, and business and, and beg your pardon, on technology and business. He comes with a world of expertise, not only in how to make things happen, but how to advise and how to oversee the projects that make the world that we live in a better place. It's a great pleasure to me, for me to invite to the stage Dr. Avin Gupta. systemic enough to have a presentation, but I'm going to be innovative enough to not to talk from the presentation. I hope that's fine. And um, uh, I have a, a very difficult task of starting out uh, laying the ground for this uh, first ever Israel-Asia summit. And thank you for inviting me here. It's a pleasure. It's my first visit to Israel. It's been uh, great so far. And we hope it will continue like that. Uh, I am one of those people who carry, could carry multiple business cards. You know, for those of us who were present yesterday, we were discussing this problem of multiple business cards. So I could wear many hats, um, and uh, I do wear many hats. And one of the hats that I wear and I represent today is of a, of, of a policy maker who's been an innovator, an entrepreneur, but now affecting change in policies that impact millions and billions of um, lives, uh, in India at least. So I speak from a very uh, compassionate view of what are today's challenges and where innovation can actually make a big difference. Um, how we can collaborate, how we can do things uh, in, in a world which is, uh, which is sometimes unknown to us. And uh, that's been my journey for the last couple of years uh, in my role as a policymaker in this part of the world. Uh, I like to start off by talking about uh, Asia for Asia. Now, you know, uh, we've been talking about Israel, Asia, you know, we've talked about cross-border, but something that we need to ponder about, Asia as a continent, um, Asia as a, as a cultural corridor, has been one of the most prominent corridors for centuries. Uh, we have a shared history of uh, at least uh, 3,000 to 4,000 years. Uh, we are in the midst of cities where uh, 3,000 years is un un not uncommon. And uh, what is that we have done together is what we need to talk about, what we need to think about. And uh, I think, uh, you know, the conference title says uh, Innovation for Tomorrow's Challenges. Some of the things that I'll talk about are today's challenges. They're actually waiting to happen today. They're probably, uh, you know, yesterday's challenges, as we say it. So uh, we need to think about how Asia as an ecosystem can work together and really take away from here uh, some of those platforms, some outcomes that we can actually action. We see a lot of cooperation, a lot of collaboration already happening. But is it, uh, it can, can it be taken to a level, uh, to the next level, where we can actually solve problems which, which, which I'll talk about a few of those problems. But let me start off and let's see if it, this works or oh, technology works. So I have a small presentation, a uh, small video to show you. This used to have sound effects. It, it still does actually, thank you. That was my cue. A little specific to India, but I'll, I'll share how this is more relevant to the whole of Asia. This is uh, actually a vehicle. And uh, this farmer has figured out how to make vehicle from very, very old, used uh, electricity generators, old vehicles. So he, he, this is a very functional vehicle. This lady didn't have access to electricity 
and she's converted, uh, she, you know, she's made a, her own washing machine and she says the side effects are she keeps very fit also. As you can see, it is doubling up. And this one is my favorite. This this person got inspired by seeing a movie, uh, one of the 007 series. What he is saying is, I need to cross the river. And he couldn't wait for six hours to meet his wife. So he's talking about he's become, he's talking about becoming an innovator, and I, I'm going to make a few points here. We have had a lot of culture of innovation, because as I said, scarcity has been the mother of innovation for us. And this is common thread that I, you know, if you travel across Asia, my friends from other parts of Asia will conquer. That we've, 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 it's not that we are trying to use a single resource multiple times. We don't have resources. We're trying to find ways to survive. We're trying to find ways, a billion people are trying to find ways to make a, make a living. And when that is happening, it's a, it's, it's a, there are a lot of compelling reasons to think about how solutions from the rest of the world, especially in Asia, can actually solve those problems. Uh, we've had, as I said, a lot of cultural innovation. Have, have we scaled it up? Has the gentleman who built this uh, cycle boat, I, if I may call it, has it been able to solve other people's problem? No, we have had cultural innovation, but you sitting over here have done a lot of systematic in, in, innovation, a very institutional form of innovation. This is where a collaboration needs to happen. We need to learn how to, how to commercialize this and actually make a difference to a lot of people. A few facts, I think that I'm being repetitive over here, but uh, you know, one of the most common things that you see in Asia is aspirations. Aspirations are skyrocketing. Resources won't meet these aspirations. That's, that's for sure. And, but it's a very well-connected world. Uh, I, in India, tele-density is almost 90 percent. And that applies to most of Asia. Tele-density is very, very high. Now, why I bring this about is, for them, a phone is, is an essential thing. We leapfrog the landline revolution. So everybody has a phone because that's the easiest thing to get. We, we have a joke actually, it's easier to get a, uh, a phone in India or a pizza reaches you in 30 minutes, an ambulance reaches you in 30 days. So uh, you know, those are things that have become from a consumer perspective so, so commonly available that everybody has access to them. Smartphones, probably about 8 to 10 percent. So how can we use this ecosystem to, to deploy currently available solutions or innovations to solve the problems that they face, that we face today. And, and uh, as a consumer of, uh, of innovation, we have no choice. We have to consume innovation. We consume innovation. A billion people, you know, what is the number one spend, aspirational spend, that if you survey people across Asia, they will tell you, apart from their non-essential spend, is education. Education is their biggest need. Three million teachers are shot as of right now, all across Asia. More than 1.5 million hospitals are not there, that should be there. How do we use technology and innovation to solve these ground level problems? And I, the, 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 the talk, that I, the, the message that I want to give, it's an and world. What do I mean by that? That we can continue to solve the high tech, the, uh, the quality of life issues. But there is also a world which is bottom of the pyramid, a billion people within Asia, out of this four billion people, a billion people are bottom of the pyramid, which live on two dollars a day, less than two dollars a day. How can we change their lives? And uh, do we have innovations? Or what kind of platforms do, do we need to build to actually make a difference to them? Some of the areas, we're going to talk a lot about it. Uh, education is a primary 
driver. It's the biggest aspirational thing all across India, all across Asia. How people can get primary education? It's, it's, can we think totally inside and outside the box and change in, uh, education? We've had mobile education. Now, this is not over smartphones. Literally, people are putting a classroom on a speaker phone and, and students are learning. Will it work? Will it not? What will be the outcomes? Remains to be seen. But it's, it's an approach. It's an approach that people are trying. Right? These are remote areas, villages, all across Asia where there is no internet connectivity, but there is mobile. So I think the one big string here is the mobile connection, and I think we should use it a lot more. Uh, of course, primary health. There's a lot of policy impetus required uh, in terms of primary health. You know, I, um, I, I always give this example. iPhone is a status symbol for most of, the, most of the world, for a lot of us. But in most of rural, semi-rural belts, it is actually a device which has huge computing power. It's not something that they use to play games. It's actually used as a micro bank in a lot of countries. It's actually used as a, 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 a diagnostic device to measure temperature. We saw some demonstration yesterday of how tablets could be doing that. So those are real problems. Can it print out a prescription? A doctor is still required. But if a doctor sitting remotely gives a prescription on an iPhone, is it valid? Those are policy issues. But if you, if you start solving such issues together, we solve a very big problem of access to primary health care to a majority, about you know, one-sixth of Earth's population. And that's a huge impact. We can't talk about 4,000 years, 1,000 years. We can talk about 50 years. That's, uh, you know, in a country uh, where, where I come from, where a lot of us come from, where we are presenting right now, 50 years looks very minor. But that's our lifespan. That's the foreseeable future we can see. And I think there are some things that we can do to make a difference in that future. Uh, as I said, it's an and world. Uh, we, we need to solve some bottom of the pyramid problems but, uh, for domestic consumption. But we, continue to, we should continue to collaborate to generate more IP to, in a way, fund our domestic uh, efforts too. Uh, we've been very successful in, uh, in IP-based exports. And the whole of Asia has been India, Israel, China. We've done exceedingly well, and we should continue to do there, uh, do well and cooperate. And I'll talk about a value chain that I think we should, we should think of as one of the things, as an outcome of this summit. You know, summits uh, should also start talking about what, what are the next steps, what are the outcomes that, and I see a lot of workshops here which talk about how we can work together. We could be at different levels of engagement with different countries. Some places we could be markets. Some places trading partners. Where we need to move to is innovation partnerships. Understand problems of scale. Understand how this can impact uh, the, the billion people that I'm talking about, size, scale, speed. And, you know, talk about innovation partnerships, localizing solutions, and, of course, then moving up to co-creation, which is, which is really the, the level of engagement that, that should be uh, uh, something that we should see in the foreseeable future and is the, is the right level of engagement for, uh, for Asia for Asia concept. Uh, Again, moving on, there are a few thoughts that I should leave you with. Uh, success stories make a difference. We should, we should start small, but make them, uh, make them very big success stories. They have a great impact. Success is infectious. It, it, it really makes other people say, hey, the, you know, they, there is a model here now, and we can make it work. So each of the countries that we represent should make working cross-border a few examples of great successes, not in just market creation or partnerships, but in co-creation and innovation partnerships. And that should be the level of engagement we should try, uh, strive for. Uh, can we think about exchange of skilled manpower cross borders? Skilled manpower, skilled resources. I'm told I'm too old in Israel. And India, and in the political field that I am, it's, it's still considered very young. We are, we are the youth brigade. 
See, it's how, how relative it is. And uh, uh, can we get expert and resources with a lot of uh, the right experience, uh, not age, but right experience, come and champion this, evangelize these kind of cross-border relationships across Asia. It's, it's a difficult thing given, given the kind of uh, uh, bordered uh, worlds we, we stay in. The kind of passport stamps I have on my passports is not funny. I mean, every country just loves to give you ma many stamps, I think. And uh, how do we get resources to move across freely and talk about uh, borderless innovation when people cannot move around? So th we have to think about the special skill category, the special category of people who can help in this innovation ecosystem. Uh, the other thing I talked about, I think a lot of, uh, what, and this is specific how Israel can cooperate or collaborate, is develop an IP culture, uh, you know, innovation culture. How do you work towards that? A lot of us do need um, a lot of institutional thinking in that, and that's very important. How do you embed it in our education systems, our higher ed education systems, and uh, benefit from it? Uh, I'll leave you with the last thought, and that is how can we string the pearls? A lot of distributed pearls exist all around Asia. You string them, they are much more valuable. So the, so the investors, the venture capitalists, start thinking about how you can create clusters around innovation, around problems and opportunities, really around opportunities to string the pearls and create a much valuable ecosystem than the small silos that could exist as individual pearls. So with that, uh, I wish this conference, this summit, uh, great success. And um, I'm absolutely excited uh, to be here. And uh, uh, for anything that we can represent and do in, uh, in at least the country that I represent, India, would, uh, would love to take it forward. And uh, that's our commitment to innovation. Thank you very much.